why don't we look at Emily White Witch of Amherst, which I will read and then we can talk about it. The shy white witch of Amherst killed her teachers with her love. Rather mine entomb my mind, or best that soft gray dove. Emily, uh, <laughs> you know, how, let's just start with how does a beat, and here we have witch, which is, you know, sort of a, the witchy mode that Ann Waldman inherits from the beats partly suggests a certain beat attitude, beatitude. At the same time, here's this admiration for Emily, who would not seem to be a beat progenitor. Can you say anything about how this poem helps us understand that dichotomy? Yeah, I think um, the shy white witch of Amherst, just <clears throat> imagining Emily as both shy and empowered as some type of supernatural force, um, is just a really evocative image. And um, yeah, I, I think I'm not entirely, this doesn't feel, this feels beat to me in the way that um, Queeley feels beat, um, compressed, but also kind of wandering in its imagery, mm. multiple turns in the course of only a few lines. Thank you. Allie, um, what do you do with the reference that's apparently of to Emily Dickinson in the first line, and then killed her teachers, which seems not something that Emily Dickinson, at least biographically, would have done. What do you do with killed her teachers? Um, the easiest place that my mind went for that is just seeing her teachers as the tradition that came before her, and especially since in Mod Poe... Went we, her own direction. Right, yeah. In, in Mod Poe, we see Emily as being the, um, the origin of a, um, a style or a tradition as opposed to the inheritor of anything, especially when... What she could have inherited was this very traditional, mostly male form. Um, and so that's what I think of uh, when I see killed her teachers as kind of, yeah, just diverging from that practice. The Anna beards, or anyone? Hmm? The gray beards, that what we call them? What do we call them? The are you are you looking at me as a gray beard? What are you doing? <laughs> no. Never. Anna, Never. here's a quiz for you, a Mod Poe quiz. Not Where... Where in Mod Poe have we encountered a reference to destroying the teachers? Uh, well, in Walt. In uh, Walt, Walt in Whitman, Walt, right? Yeah. So here we have a, a, a what Elise is it? Cowan. Do something. Well, it's oh, so, wait. you're I testing know, us it. now. Uh, basically, on. the paraphrase is anyone who can um, defeat me as the teacher. Um, will prove my value as a teacher. Yeah. Right. So here we have Elise Cowan, who's a very much affiliated with the beat movement, but very much on the margins of it as a woman, identifying with Dickinson, borrowing from Whitman this strong, angry idea of, inf of poetic influence. Do you have anything to say about that? I know that's not what you were thinking of saying, but... <laughs> What do you want to tee me up you know, there? How do we deal with Elise Cowan as a beat who's interested in, in Dickinson? And what kind of Dickinson is this? Is this a Dickinson that you like? Oh, it's definitely a Dickinson that I like. Um, I guess I, I feel um, so much of the kind of homage to Dickinson and the, the way she's got this kind of slant rhyme happening here and the, the sort of middle inset stanza. Show us the slant rhyme. Uh, well, we've got killed her teachers with her love. Rather mine in tomb, my mind, or best that soft gray dove. Basically, the last you know kind of set of lines do this. You mean a lot of internal rhyming? Internal and also that, but it, it, yes, like there's the internal kind of sound rhyme mm -hmm. um, and kind of Dickinsonian. So it's very Dickinsonian in its intensiveness and intensity. Um, but Emily, it has this beat like attitude? At, yeah, be attitude. <laughs> Emily, you're a good close reader. Translate into plain English the following, okay? Killed her teachers with her love. Rather mine entomb my mind. It's hard. Yeah, killed her teachers with her love. Rather mine entomb my mind. Um, actually, that diction is a little tricky for me. Is she is saying... She's, go ahead. <clears throat> is she saying, what is the, the rather that's... that's being deployed here. Well, she's making a distinction right. between what Emily did to her teachers, rather mine entombed. So rather than killing 
her teachers, which is what Emily did, Elise must or wants to, it's not clear, entomb her teachers in her mind. Is that what she's saying? And that would be sad. So maybe the Dickinsonian beat woman is fated to not be able to kill her teacher, her poetic influences. Yeah, I think also um, when you say, I just kill her teachers with her love, we've been separating um, those two lines, but it seems almost impossible to interpret them as, as separate entities because to kill someone with kindness for something does not mean to kill them literally. It is, um, it's a play on that violence. Kill with kindness. A, yeah, right. a disavowal of that right. violence. Right. Allie, can you, you know, Emily, it's a rare move on Emily's part, but she more or less punted on that. Yeah, part. I think you did. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know her well enough to know when she's punting. <laughs> Allie, what do you think about this? Well, I think the mine refers to teachers, I, as you were saying. My teachers, right. right. I have to entomb them. So, but I see Is it, it a kind suicidal of the poem? opposite way in that her teachers... Her, her teachers are preventing her mind from okay. what it's capable of. And, and this next yes. couple of lines that I think is particularly tricky or best that soft gray dove seems to me to be her mind at its potential best. Nice. And and I just can't look at that line or best the soft gray dove. That's something that can um, fl that can fly. And, and so be I think of it just makes me think of spreading your hands wide to gather yeah. paradise. Yeah, no, that's good. The, the the last two lines are very Dickinsonian. Why don't we turn to the next poem? It's called Emily. It was not given a title. It was found in manuscript with the first line being Emily, and it reads this way. Emily, come summer, you'll take off your jeweled bees, which sting me. I'll strip my stinking jeans hand in hand. We'll run outside, look straight at the sun a second time, and get tan. That's marvelous. Let's Reminds just... me of um, You Are My Friend. There's a you are my friend. There's a um, a uh, what Eileen Miles calls a lesbianity about it. Uh, there's there's a there's an a, there's an effort to br to bring Emily forward into a world where women wear jeans, and and ta taking the Dickinsonian boldness of looking straight at the sun, which of course will blind you. Mm -hmm. Allie, what do you think? It's supposed to lean against the sun. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's. Yeah, there's definitely a reference there. Allie, what do you think of this poem? Uh, I mean, I love it. I really like the juxtaposition between the kind of immaterial mythicness that she lends to Emily um, compared to her stinking genes. You know, like, she's <laughs> such a creature of the flesh in this poem. And, I and she's like, beat. Yeah, and I like the image of those two things kind of lying next to each other and getting she, she wants to get She wants <laughs> to get, get naked with Emily Dickinson. And she asks Emily, you know, what Emily's, what, what, what uh, Elise is wearing are her stinking jeans, so take those off in the, on a sunny day. But uh, what Emily's wearing is jeweled bees. Just love that. Emily, a uh, further thought on this? Yeah, I was also <clears throat> thinking what Anna said about this, having some type of <clears throat> Whitman in, in the supermarket type of vibe. Um, in some sense, it might, might be uh, one of the many kind of revisionist or kind of um, reclaiming readings of Emily that are available that Susan Howe performed that um, is an entire part of Emily's scholarship. And I like this one because it, it's not Emily as a witch, it's Emily as um, a girl, girlhood friend, as an ally. Um, and possibly, had she lived in our time, a lesbian. Yeah, precisely. And yeah. someone who would just run around naked, which seems a little unlikely. Yeah, but also, you know, if um, to play on that, uh, you know, lesbian subtext, there is also something at once innocent and lovely about the idea that these two girls and a, a kind of incipient um, same-gendered romance could be happening out in the sun and getting tan um, in the 1950s when, um, you know, this particular, like, just completely female experience just wasn't really possible as a public spectacle. You know, and the beats are not my favorite, and I, but I think if you can summarize broadly um, one thing, one commitment they all have in common, it is this type of anti-authority thing um, of expressing an anti-authoritarian impulse in your poetry. And so in some sense, uh, this could be more beat than the most male 
beady mm. beats that we know. Beady beats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to find birds. <laughs> um, but yeah, to, to subvert both the, the masculinity of beatness, to subvert beats themselves within this beat poem, seems to be kind of the culmination of exactly the energy that that tradition has been trading in. Very well said. And I, just a final thought for me about this second poem. I really like how she sticks in a second time, looks straight at the sun a second time. It either means that they've done it before, they should have learned their lesson because they were blinded the first time. But it also suggests that Emily, Emily Dickinson might have another shot, that we might have another shot at Emily and that we might, she might get liberated and she might get naked and she might be dancing around in the 50s and show the beats how to be really beat. <laughs>